Financial planning means many things to many people. Uh, do you have a financial plan? Or more importantly, do you know the power of what a plan can do? Welcome everyone, show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson here, certified financial planner, president of Pure Financial Advisor. And of course, the show would not be a show without Big Al Clopine. Good morning, Joe, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic, Al, how are you? Same, can't wait for this show. Financial planning, yeah. you know anything about it? It's what we do. <laughs> it is, it is <laughs> what we do. But to you, that's the question, because if you take a look at 2020, it's been kind of a disastrous year. A lot of people have lost confidence in their overall strategy, in their overall financial plan. Do you have a plan? Do you know the power of what planning can do? That is today's Financial Focus. CNBC just did a study of looking at what is concerning us right now. And of course, about 60% of us were worried about jobs, we're worried about the economy, and of course, healthcare. But when you have a financial plan, a financial strategy, you've already mapped this out. Your confidence gains so high when things go bad in the economy, if you lose your job, and unfortunately, if we get sick, you have to start mapping this out to help us out. Let's bring in the big man, Big El Clopino. Wow, Joseph, that's quite an introduction there. I appreciate that, I think. But let's talk about the power of financial planning because this is what gets us through life financially from birth to end of life. So what is financial planning? Well, you want to start out with a written plan. That's number one. Number two is you need to build an emergency fund. We're going to go over how, what amount, what level of emergency funds you probably ought to have. You've got to make sure you've got a plan for health care costs, whether it's insurance or post-retirement, Medicare or supplement. You need to maintain your investing discipline. And finally, what if things go wrong? Protecting against market risk as well as other kinds of risks. Uh, a lot of folks during this pandemic have realized the importance of planning. Right. I mean, if you look at this uh, half. Yeah. Unfortunately, right, we needed a pandemic. <laughs> for people to, to start realizing, it's like, well, wait a minute, maybe I should take a step back here to figure out exactly what I should be doing in case the market drops 20 or 30%, in case I lose my job or my spouse loses a job, or in case I get sick, right? If you map this out, your confidence, as I said before, you need to gain the confidence so you don't make those stupid decisions. And the first step of this, Al, is just having a written plan. It is, Joe, and I think a lot of people don't really know what should go into a written plan, so let's talk about that. So I think number one is to reflect on your personal goals, and, and that sounds like kind of a vague concept, but let me tell you what that means. That means when do you want to retire? What kind of lifestyle in retirement? What do you think your life expectancy is based upon your health and based upon your family's health? Uh, what kind of, uh, do you want to buy a vacation home? Do you want to travel? Develop a time horizon. When do you want to retire? Okay, then you got those couple things. Then, Joe, you can start to develop a game plan uh, in terms of what you need to save to be able to get there. Yeah, I think it's important for us to look at your goals, right? Because we could talk strategy all day long. We could talk about what you should do and how you should invest your money, what tax strategies are important. Uh, to make sure that you can mitigate the tax burden. But if there's no goal, right, you're probably not gonna take action to begin with. So it's just writing things down. It could be on a, a, a napkin. Here, this is what I wanna accomplish. This is what it's going to look like. Once you write that down, pen to paper, you're much more apt to accomplish it. Harvard studies have done this. It's like, if I just think, yeah, I wanna retire someday. Yeah, sure, I'll put the little kids to school. But if you don't write down specifically of what that really looks like, Al, it's really hard for people to accomplish it. I think that's why so many Many people fail you know financially I think writing is a key Joe because once you've written it down you've got something to look at go back to uh, so it, once you figure out your goals and that really is step one and you figure out how much you need to save to get there okay then we've got something now you can start going back to investing how are you going to invest to achieve that goals um, how are you going and then once you have that monitoring your plan um, making sure you're on track, making course corrections. Sometimes you may have to save a little bit more because you got a little bit behind. 
kids in college or whatever it may be. Uh, these are the kinds of things you got to do to make sure you, you stay the course. Yeah, but uh, you know, things change, right? You, you have a specific goal in mind today, it could change tomorrow. I mean, it could change in a year or three years. So you want to make sure that it's fluid, right? By doing all these different techniques as the market corrects, right? You're rebalancing it, making sure that your target rate of return is still on track. But I tell you what, writing things down and making sure that you have course corrections when things will change, I'll guarantee you that. That's the only thing we can really guarantee on this show is that life will throw curveballs. Your goals will change. Making sure that you can adapt and change with them is so key. Right, people focus on like product maybe, or they hear something on a TV show or radio show, hey, I get a certain rate of return, but then there's very little liquidity. They can't really adapt as their goals change. Yeah, and I think you know when it comes to investing, Joe, you have to have a plan. You have to have your investments working together in that plan so that you can achieve what your goals are. And I think once you've kind of done all that, first step is to make sure you develop uh, an emergency fund. And, and there's a lot of different ideas on how much you should have in emergency funds. I think most financial planners would say save three to six months of your spending, right? If you're spending 5,000 a month, for an example, three months of that's 15,000, that would give you an idea of how much to have an emergency account. And uh, it depends though, uh, Joe, because it depends upon your employment. If your employment is very steady, government job, maybe you get by a little bit less. If it's construction or something that's variable, maybe you need six months or a year. Yeah, I, and I think what people need to look at is part of an asset class is their human capital. Yeah. Right? If, if I'm in, let's say, landscaping, I, I could have huge years and then some years are downs and then huge years or construction as you said home building you know but if I'm a tenure professor right I have a pretty much you know safe income that is reliable so I might not necessarily need a huge cash reserve but if I'm in a, a, a business where I could have a really slow year you might need 12 months of income as a cash reserve so uh, everything's very specific uh, specific easy for me to say. It, it is. Uh, but when you start developing your plan. It is and I think Joe there's a lot of myths when it comes to emergency funds and, and the first one is should I invest my emergency fund for growth and uh, we would say no because the emergency fund the whole point of that is so you can get to it quickly when there's when the unexpected happen and the unexpected it could be losing a job and maybe the if you the stock market is good great but a lot of times the unexpected happens when the stock market is down so you want to keep that money safe another one is a home equity loan some people think their home equity loan is their emergency fund i'm here to tell you that does not always work in uh, 2008 2009 during the great recession a lot of home equity loans got shut down including my own and so don't consider that that's going to be there when you need it. Joe, another one is uh, I have too much debt, right? So I can't possibly start an emergency fund because I got to pay off this debt. But things happen. You need to have, well, you need here's to have an Here's a problem fund. with that mindset, though, right? Is that, you know, your buddy, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Dave Ramsey, yeah. right? Yes. Pay off debt, pay off debt, pay off debt before you do anything else. I mean, I totally disagree with that because what happens is that you're paying off debt, paying off debt. I get that paying off debt is good. Don't get me wrong. But if you don't have emergency cash and let's say the car breaks down or something happens, guess what? You're just going to have a cycle of debt again. There's no cash to pay for any type of emergency. So you're paying off this debt. You have to have a little bit of a balance of both. And, you know, another one, once I reach retirement, I don't necessarily need a cash yeah, reserve. Yeah, because I can pull out my IRA dollars and, and, you know what, you pull those out, they're all taxable. You may not be in a situation where you want to pay tax. Particularly if money is tight, do you want to pay tax on top of the emergency it itself? Not yeah. really. <laughs> I mean, in every stage of life, you're going to have a different strategy. Uh, because the strategies that you utilize to accumulate wealth needs to change once you hit retirement and take distributions. So of course the amount of money that you have in your cash reserve is going to be different as you're accumulating, as you have small kids, as you're paying for school and you have big mortgages. And then once you retire, you still need cash on hand because you still need to provide yourself an income to supplement social security, pensions and the like. Couldn't agree more, Joe. Everyone needs a financial plan. Not everyone needs a planner, but everyone needs a financial plan. Yeah, go to our website, folks. Go to Your Money Your com. As Al said, you don't necessarily need a planner, but you need a plan. So we got a DIY 
Retirement guide, do it yourself. Go to yourmoneyyourwealth.com, click on that guide, and get on your path to financial freedom. And you don't want to miss next segment. We got Jake Greenberg. He's a certified financial planner, managing director of Peer Financial Advisors. We're going to break down more financial planning topics, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Hey, welcome back to the show. Show's called Your Money or Wealth. Stick around for this segment. We got Jake Greenberg, certified financial planner, managing director up here, financial advisors. We're going to break down the key components of your financial plan. Uh, but before we do that, let's see how you did on the true false question. A 65 year old couple would, on average, expect to pay $295,000 for health care throughout the rest of their lives. And that's actually a true statement. Fidelity does a study each year and figures out how much money people are going to spend over the rest of their lives as a couple at age 65. But before you get too afraid of that number, I would think of that more in terms of maybe $5,000 per person per year. That's really what that kind of comes down to. You don't necessarily, Joe, need to have a full lump sum of $295,000. So right? It's that, the whole fear thing, right? It, yeah. you know, people look at that and they're like, man, I need $300,000. Yeah. I only have $300,000 for my entire right, retirement. But then you break it down into a monthly, then it's a little bit more easier to bite. So what are people paying? I don't know. You're, you're getting close to retirement, bud. Getting, getting you closer. Get your, you got your budget? Yeah. So, you know, you look at this graph, about 18% of this is, uh, is drugs, uh, generic drugs and so forth. 43% is other medical expenses, including co-payments and co-insurance. And 39% is Medicare premiums, doctor appointments, hospital visits. What's interesting, though, is you don't see any long-term care here. And that's on purpose. That's not part of this. So the 200 95,000 that Fidelity has come up with does not include long-term care. So, Joe, people do need to think about that, at least have a plan. Yeah. One way is health insurance, or long-term care insurance, of course, but that's expensive and not necessarily affordable for a lot of people. So just have a, have a thought out plan, whether it's selling your home or whatever. Well, I mean, I think that's the whole topic of today, right? So if it's retirement, putting kids through school, maybe passing wealth to the next generation, or if you have a long-term care stay, you or your spouse, right? There's a lot of different goals that people have by having a written plan. You know, it makes things a lot easier to handle. Let's bring in Jake Greenberg to break things down a little bit further in regards to constructing an overall financial plan. Jake. Welcome to the show, my friend. Of course, thank you for having me here today. Yeah, we're talking about the power of financial planning, right? So if someone's at home that has not ever written a financial plan, what should be their first steps? What do you think? Well, if you've never written a financial plan before, I would say the first step is kind of figuring out what you've got, what you need, and what some of your goals are for the future. So how do you pinpoint that? Like people say, yeah, I have goals, and they're kind of vague with it. How do you dive in a little bit deeper so they can get very specific? The first step that I always have people do is just how do we make it so that you can at least continue doing what you're doing now? And then if we want to do extras like take a couple of nicer vacations or buy a vacation property or fund my uh, grandkids college education, those are kind of additional items that we try to start solving for next. So it's just basically putting together some inventory. What, 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 the, what do you have first of all, right? So what do you have in assets? What do you have potentially for income? And then do that inventory and then figure out, okay, well, what are you spending now? And then try to map it out so at least they can maintain their same lifestyle. What are some of the math? What, what's the steps that someone would need to do? From, let's say, if I'm spending $50,000, how much money would I need? So kind of a basic rule of thumb is something called a 4% rule, which says essentially take whatever you've got and multiply it by 4%. And that tells you how much you could safely spend each year without running out of money during a typical maybe 25 to 30 year retirement time horizon. And then you equate that to income. And I think that's where the disconnect happens, right? Is that, well, I need a million dollars. I should be able to spend $100,000 a year. I'm a millionaire. Right? But that only equates really to 30, 40,000 because we're living a heck of a lot longer. Well, of course, when looking at what you've got, that three to 4%, that's a total distribution rate. So. If all of your money is in tax deferred accounts, for example, that three to 4% number is gonna to have to include the tax you're gonna be pulling out of that account too. So as we prep for retirement, not just knowing what you have and what you need is important, but also knowing what are the ramifications of utilizing what you have. Is it gonna be taxed? Is it tax free? And how does that work? What, what time frame can I pull it out? For example, I've got people that sometimes retire in the early 50s, but all of their money is in IRAs. So, what are the strategies there when you can't 
you know, in a normal situation, pull money out until you're 59 and a half. What's the plan? That's a really good point because these are pitfalls that could happen to someone that all of a sudden once they reach their retirement date, they're like, oh shoot, I didn't really think about that, yeah. right? And so first is identifying goals and then from there really figuring out what you have, right? What you want to accomplish. And then looking at now, getting a little bit more sophisticated, I guess, from a tax perspective of how the income will come to you. And then when does the portfolio get involved? I think it's just a matter of looking at what do you currently have and what kind of risk are you comfortable taking? And what I find most of the time when I meet somebody, uh, let's say they're 60 years old and I take a look at their portfolio, maybe their 401k, it's as if they're still 30 years old when I look at their portfolio, they haven't changed their allocation in years. So. I hear like in 2008 when people said, you know, I was about ready to retire, my portfolio fell 50%. That tells me you probably didn't readdress your portfolio in who knows how long. Maybe since you opened the 401k when you started at the company 30 years ago. So as you're doing financial planning and figuring out what you need, you really need to identify what level of risk am I comfortable with? What do I need my portfolio to do? What rate of return do I even need? Because let's say we do all the math and it says you just need a 5% rate of return to do all the things in life you ever wanted to do. Well, why take on the extra risk to try to get 7 8%? Now, from a human perspective, we understand why we want more, but is it worth taking on the extra risk to get that? And I think we need to, before you start clicking buttons and moving money around and making big decisions, kind of figuring out what do you need your money to do, and then we can figure out how to start investing it. And then, of course, that just blows up. The door is open on a whole, probably another episode of this show. You know? You, you know, you bring up a really good point though, Jake, is that let's say if someone has $2 million hypothetically and th th they're thrifty, they don't spend a lot of money, and that $2 million goes to $3 million, it's probably not going to change their life, right? But if that $2 million goes to 500 grand, I mean, that is devastating to a lot of people. So it's why take on the extra risk. You know, it's nice to have a little bit more, but is it really gonna change your life to have a little bit more versus if you have a lot less, how much more is that gonna change your life? So I think that's a really, really good point. When do people start shifting though? So when you said, hey, I look at a portfolio, it's like, hey, when's the last time you changed this? You're 60, you look like a 25 year old here, right? On paper or your portfolio does. When should they start looking at transitioning their portfolio? The typical, uh, you know, money magazine type article would say, you know, take your age, subtract it from 100, that's how much you should have in stock. But that's not reality. In fact, one of my oldest clients, he's 96 years old, he's one of my most aggressive clients. Why? He served in World War II, he's got a pension from the US Air Force, he has a pension from the company that he retired from, and he's got Social Security. He doesn't even need to touch his portfolio. So. In cases like that, it's like, well, what is the goal of this money? And I always tell someone that we need to look at what is the demand on the money going to be before we say, well, because you're retiring, that means we need to go more conservative or because you're older now, we need to go more conservative. That's just not always the case. We need to look at how much money do we need from this portfolio? Because let's say you're somebody with a million dollar portfolio, but taking out 10 grand a month, you're probably going to have to be a lot more conservative than somebody that maybe has a $500,000 portfolio and only takes out two grand a month. Right, so it just really depends on what's the demand. Great stuff, Jake. You know, when we're looking at financial planning, you wanna be very specific to your overall goals. Start with your goals, figure out what you have from an inventory standpoint, and then start mapping things out. Don't forget about taxes, and then look at constructing the overall portfolio. Go to yourmoneyandwealth.com. You can do it yourself, folks, if you want to. Get our DIY uh, retirement guy, Jake Greenberg. Thank you very much, my friend. Thanks for having me. We'll be back in just a second. Don't go anywhere. Hey, welcome back to the show. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. I uh, want to thank Jake Greenberg for joining us, uh, getting some good information there. And by the way, uh, do you know that we have a DIY retirement guide? Do it yourself retirement guide. Go to yourmoneywealth.com, click on that special guide, and get on the path you know where, to financial freedom. Uh, we got a lot of stuff to go through before we get into any of that good stuff. Uh, let's see how you did on the true false question. Two benefits of investing in international funds are diversification and growth. And yeah, that's a true statement. International funds are you know, generally in their companies in other countries besides the US, obviously. And you can have developed countries, you can have emerging uh, countries with companies. 
Uh, they do grow like the U.S. in general. They, they don't grow any more or any less than U.S. stocks. But here's the key. They grow and fall at slightly different times. So it gives you diversification. With one exception, that's emerging markets. They tend to grow higher over the long term. It's just a lot more volatile. And so I think that's a reason why people should be invested in international because they tend to zig and zag at, at different times. You know, living in the U.S., right, if, if we look at most of your portfolios out there, I would say you're heavily leaned more towards U.S. type companies. And people don't understand even how to invest in international companies. But some of the biggest companies in the world, of course, are not located here. So uh, diversification is going to be your best friend or it could be your worst nightmare. So when you look at the, the performance, Al, you know, when things go bad, you know, people enjoy diversification, but things are really good, then they hate it. Yeah, that's exactly right. Let's talk about diversification during the, um, the Great Recession. Uh, March of 2009 was the low. But this actually starts in January 2008 to February 2009. This would be at the value of $100,000 during that period of time. And what you can see is from beginning of eight to the low of the market, Cash did better. Cash did, doesn't do much. A diversified portfolio went down. And an all-stock portfolio, of course, went down. I mean, that's what happens with stocks. But look what happens if you sort of look at the recovery after March. Cash, of course, stayed the same. The diversified portfolio did rather well. All-stock did better, of course, if the stock market is going up. But here, to me, is the key. If you look at both periods together, beginning of January to past the recovery, you can see that, the, of course, the stocks did better, but Diversified did almost as well without as much a, a dangerous of a ride. And this also shows why you stay invested, because a lot of people got out at this point and then never reinvested. It's important to stay invested, stay in the market, and that's such a hard thing to do, Joe, when the market is, is going up and down, is to stay the course, but I think it's important. Yeah, I mean, diversification has a lot of benefits. Uh, but yeah, when you see the markets tank, and if you're diversified, right? Yeah, of course. You know, in 2008, that's kind of a terrible example, to be honest with you, is because everything kind of w was correlated together. It really didn't matter if you had international stocks, emerging market stocks, small companies, large companies, whatever. The market cratered. Um, so, but if you look over the long term of diversification, adds a lot more value. It also keeps people in their seat. I think is the more important thing because you're not going to see those huge dips. But on the other side, then they get anxious or not anxious but they get upset because if I had all stocks you know my portfolio would have done X but because I was diversified I had cash and bonds and maybe real estate in there that that tampered my overall rate of return then they might jump ship on that end too so we, we do see that and, and the whole idea of diversification really is to have a smoother ride and that's important when you're in retirement and when you think about rebalancing this is another important concept stocks tend to rise more than bonds and at times you need to sell stocks and buy more bonds. Sometimes it's the other way when the market's going down. But here's a real quick example. January 2009 to December 2018, 10-year period. What happens if they didn't rebalance at all? Well, you can see the stocks became rather large, which is not necessarily a bad thing, except now you have a lot of stocks in your portfolio and you're taking more risks than perhaps you need to do. Now, if you had rebalanced, at, at different points twice a year, you can see you can stay more coordinated. And this is important. You, you know, when you're making money, when you're saving, it's, it's okay to have a much higher stock valuation. But when in retirement, you want to have a lot more safety so you don't have these, this big volatility because you're pulling money out at the same time. And so I think that's an important concept. Sometimes people have a hard time going from growth to conservative growth and it's rebalancing as part of that. Yeah, but also it's, it's hard for people to do because you're selling your winners and you're buying your losers, sure. right? Because, oh, the stock market is doing good and you want to maintain a certain risk profile, you have to sell some of those stocks to buy bonds or to buy other asset classes that are down. So you're buying stocks that are down in value, but some people will look, well, I don't want to buy those because they're down in value. Well, just say it again, right? You want to buy stocks that are down in value. So it, it's a hard concept for people to grasp, but it will protect you against, um, you know, pretty volatile times. So uh, let's move on. Let's go to Ask the Experts. My CPA said I didn't get any tax benefits from my donations last year. Are there ways in the new tax law to get any benefit? 
One is if you bunch your deductions, make a bunch of donations one year and less another year, maybe you'll have enough to itemize. That'd be number one. Number two would be you could contribute to a donor advised fund, which allows you to take future year contributions and take the deduction right now. You put it in this fund, the, the year that you put the money in the fund, you get the tax deduction, you dole it out slowly over time. So you won't necessarily get a benefit every year, uh, but Joe, at least it's a way to get a benefit one year or every other year, something like that. Yeah, absolutely, bunchy. Bunchy, I know you like bunchy. That's your favorite thing to do, bunch That's your expenses. CPA's favorite term, right? Wow. Well, Sid, hopefully that helps you out. Let's talk a little bit about what else we learned today. First thing is, is that you gotta write down your goals. What are you really trying to accomplish? What is this money for that you are building? What is the wealth for? And of course, make sure that you have a maintain an emergency fund, right? Things happen in life. I mean, we're living through this pandemic. People lost jobs, furloughed, healthcare costs, right? Speaking of the pandemic, you wanna make sure that you have adequate healthcare. You wanna make sure that you have a portfolio that is properly allocated to meet your specific goals and needs. And of course, you wanna make sure that it's all protected. Put a little wrapper around it and protect it uh, in case you know things happen so that's it for us today hopefully you enjoyed the show go to yourmoneyyourwealth.com and of course you can do it yourself if you want to it's a DIY retirement guide so catchy DIY retirement guide go to yourmoneyyourwealth.com click on that special offer for your retirement guide uh, for Big Al Great job, buddy. It was fun today. My name's Joe Anderson, and uh, you just watched another great episode of Your Money, Your Wealth. We'll see you again next time.